Okay, <clears throat> I guess we're live here. So uh, hello everyone from the global audience here. So this is Tong uh, from SCB 10 x I'm a head of Venture Beauty here. So today I'm very excited to have uh, Michael Anderson with me, a co-founder of uh, Framework Ventures here. So Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here, Tong. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so today we'll discuss uh, in the topic that I think is quite unique is a DeFi investor perspective on how venture building can add value beyond just crypto VC investing. So, but, but before we jump into that topic, uh, maybe can, you can talk a bit about um, Framework Venture itself and the investing philosophy. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so uh, we started Framework Ventures about a year and a half ago um, with the core thesis that decentralized finance would be the next product market fit for blockchain technology. Um, we started investing in, in token projects with the venture thesis, um, and we're a little bit different than most other venture funds in that, uh, and, and we'll get into it, um, we have an operating company uh, as part of the framework umbrella called Framework Labs, uh, where we build internal technology, uh, we incubate concepts, um, and uh, we work with the, the protocols that we invest in on a software basis. Uh, to add value, to actively participate, um, and uh, and we think that that's one of the things that drives our edge. Nice. I think we can jump into the the framework lab, like what it is. Sure. Yeah. Um, so framework labs, as I said, is part of framework. Um, we have framework ventures, which is where we do our principal venture investing. Uh, Framework Labs is uh, effectively our management company. Um, it's where everybody is employed out of, and, and we have a team of uh, 12 engineers that are building uh, software that either bolsters the, the projects that we invest in, um, or we incubate new concepts from entrepreneurs who want to work on specific ideas, but for whatever reason, need some sort of air cover, or need some sort of support. Uh, and then we also have a series of ideas that we think will benefit the ecosystem uh, that we have bootstrapped internally uh, and are working on internally. Um, and the, the things that I think are, are different and, and the reason why decentralized finance really needs this active participation as a, as a form of edge uh, is because you know, decentralized finance is a fine term. I, I think open source finance may actually be a better term and when we're talking about composable open source networks where technology is open and available to everyone, uh, just buying and holding tokens is something that uh, I, I think is great in terms of providing capital to, to bootstrap these networks and get them to launch. Um, but what happens after the capital is, has been deployed and, and what happens when the, the token project goes from a pre-launch phase to a post-launch phase? You know, who are the first customers? Who are the first users? Uh, who's providing the initial amount of liquidity, who's you know, arbing the exchange uh, to provide efficient markets. You know, those are all the types of services that, that we want to build internally. Nice. And um, how, how, how do you think about like, what, what, what kind of support uh, do you give? I, I mean, when, when you're sourcing entrepreneurs, I think maybe start by like, like how, what do you look for? In, in the entrepreneurs that come to talk to you? Do you need to have ideas first or the developers? Yeah, so within labs, uh, so may, maybe we can disaggregate the two points. I think uh, from a venture's perspective, um, when we find deals or we find entrepreneurs who have big ideas, you know, that's what we get excited about. And uh, the bolder the idea, the, the better we think that the opportunity size is. Um, and, and when uh, we're talking about things as it relates to framework labs, uh, we still like to go after bolder ideas, but in many cases uh, within Framework Labs, you know, we kind of have two camps. Uh, the first one is an entrepreneur who has an idea, um, and we have one uh, pre-existing example of this that we've spun out so far. Um, this is a, uh, it's a donor advised fund platform, and it's the first 501c3 nonprofit organization on Ethereum mainnet. Uh, it's something that we've been bootstrapping in-house for the last 15 months but it took about 13 months to get that 501c3 status. And you know, there's effectively no use case for the product until you have the ability to have a nonprofit status so that when you're donating crypto assets to charity, you get the taxable benefit. And that, that's kind of a perfect example of something that just needs to be bootstrapped internally. And we have to wait until the US government allows us to have that nonprofit status. And it's, it's more difficult um, and, and maybe a different type of venture investment, um, but something that fit perfectly within our labs concept. Uh, the other camp of ideas is, you know, just based on our experience and, and what we've seen in the space, all the number of deals that we've seen, we end up building pretty strong convictions around what concepts, uh, what, what concepts work and, and what concepts might not work. 
Um, and you know, we're at $15 billion of total value locked in, in DeFi today. Uh, it's our thesis that to get to $100 billion, we're going to need to have a lot more regulated capital come in. And so as a regulated uh, you know, US domiciled company, it gives us a huge advantage when we want to go out and build a, a potentially semi-regulated product, which is taking advantage or providing services or um, you know, participating in the DeFi ecosystem. Uh, and, and that thesis, I think, is you know, kind of the next phase of growth and some of the projects that we're internally incubating right now. Mm -hmm. Can, can you talk a bit about uh, the process of the venture building when you're starting from the ideas and going to until uh, you, you talk a bit about the spin off? Like, what, what, how would that look like in terms of the entrepreneurs? Yeah, and, and I think it, it really depends on um, the amount of effort and the amount of capital that we put into it and the amount of time that it takes for us to build something internally. Um, and, and this is something that we debate uh, pretty frequently. Um, is this something that is going to take two or three years and going to take five to $10 million just to get to the point of launch? Uh, if that's the case, then it, it's something that we want to build a core competency and a team around internally uh, with the intention of eventually spinning it off. Um, if it's something like the example that I gave before with the donor advised fund platform, that's something that really, you know, they need office space, they need advising, um, they need, you know, connections to other investors. It's a, it's a lighter touch kind of relationship, but it's something that we want to help, you know, as, as you know, these things grow and, and need some air cover, that's perfectly attuned to what we're able to do. Um, so it really just depends on the on the project. Um, when we have the bigger kind of bolder concepts that we want to incubate in house, you know that that's something that is not only going to be you know something that that we invest in as a venture investor, uh, but it's going to take a lot longer. It's going to take more time. Don't have any examples of those yet, but but stay tuned. Yeah, that's very interesting because I think the reason I was <clears throat> asking is that we also debating right if 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 someone want to build something right, they can go to the VC track like. What are some of the um, kind of persona of people who want to come and do the venture building and work on, you know, we can talk about the incentives later on, but it's quite different. Uh, what, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, totally. And, and I think when we look at our venture portfolio as framework ventures, uh, one of the things that's pervasive across every single investment that we make um, and some of the notable ones that we've made so far, Chainlink, Synthetics, Aave, Wi-Fi, um, there's some connective tissue either in the way that we got to know the teams, uh, you know, through Chainlink, it was how we got to know Synthetics, through Synthetics, we got to know Aave, through Aave, we got to know Wi-Fi. There, there's some kind of collaboration and, and points of contact. And so that's just how we approach venture building as well. When we think about all the different points of connection and decentralized finance, open source finance, composable technology is really where the power is derived from in this industry. And we want to find ways that all of our projects, all of our portfolio companies, uh, all the things that we're incubating within labs, you know, they can all work together and they benefit each other. Um, and so that's really kind of how we evaluate things. Uh, I think that's also one of the advantages that we provide when we find an entrepreneur that wants to build something or you know, an automated or regulated investment product on top of Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, that's something that we are perfectly attuned to help enable because, you know, we're one of the largest investors in Wi-Fi. Um, and so that that kind of extra beneficial um, connection of partnership and, and collaboration is is really an advantage. Um, but it does take finding, you know, the right people. And uh, I'm a, a staunch believer in, you know, you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. Charlie Munger. Um, incentives are incredibly important. Um, and so this is something that we're still working on, but uh, we want to give as much ownership to the founders. We want to be able to give them the incentive to work as hard as they can to get this thing out. Um, and it just may take a lot longer uh, if it's a really bold project. And, and that's something that we're willing to support. Mm, okay. So um, can, can you talk a bit about how do you source uh, entrepreneur uh, specifically? Like, like Twitter, you do Twitter, how do you, like what, 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 how, how, how do you do that? Well, I think in, in DeFi, um, the rate limiter on our industry is the number of world-class founders that are, that are in this industry. And, you know, I'm in San Francisco right now, uh, you know, I, I could roll a rock down the road and, and probably hit a world-class founder uh, somewhere along the way. Um, we need to get more people into this industry who know how to build products, who know how to build organizations who know how to build um, you know, world-class outcomes. Uh, and so that's what we're really seeking when we try to find people and new ideas. And it's not necessarily uh, something where we say, hey, we have this idea, what do you think about doing this? It's really about us getting to know the best founders and saying, what's your best idea? 
Uh, or what are your best three ideas? And let's go try all three of them and see which one sticks. Um, you know, that's kind of how we approach the venture building aspect of, of labs. Um, and then in terms of some things that we know are just going to take more time, it's going to take more capital. We know it's going to work. It's just going to be a longer slog. You know, those concepts are, are more about finding the right people to fit those ideas. And, and so it kind of goes both hand, uh, both ways. Um, but for us, you know, what we're focused on is partnering with the best founders, whether it be from a venture investment perspective, from a labs incubation perspective. We just want to bring everybody that's really world class into the tent. Mm. Uh, what what what's so special about Defy that when you talk to entrepreneurs, try to you know convince them, convince you know developers to 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 come and you know join this wave? Yeah, it, it's. Um, if we think about the history of the internet, um, and I think that there's a lot of corollary uh, to what happened in the 90s, what happened in the early 2000s, um, what we view in our thesis with, with, um, with DeFi in general is that decentralized finance and blockchain technology represents in a multiple orders of magnitude decreasing of the barrier to entry to build new financial products. And what this means is that you know, what previously took years and millions of dollars to build something, and you probably had to go through the banks or financial institutions to get it done, you can now build on Ethereum with a couple thousand lines of code, a couple weeks of work, and distribute it to millions of Ethereum users. That power and the power of composable technology is really what drives this industry. And we're seeing the evidence in the, in the data. Uniswap over the last few months has consistently had more exchange volume than Coinbase Pro. They're a team of 13 people. Coinbase Pro has a couple hundred people working on their centralized exchange product. You know, that power of composable decentralized finance technologies and, and having them layer on top of each other is really what gives the power to entrepreneurs. And I think it's just going to take a couple of years for the people who are in Silicon Valley building centralized companies and, and maybe, you know, trying to work on a SaaS product or trying to work on, you know, social, social media company, um, you know, as we've seen in the past, they're going to recognize that it, it's the Robert Leshners, the Stannies, uh, the Keynes who have been able to build unicorn outcomes in a couple of years. And as people start to latch onto that concept, we're going to start to see more entrepreneurs come into the space. Uh, and that's what really gets us excited. And, and we're starting to see that flow of talent from the traditional technology companies into the space. It's just going to take some time. Yeah. <laughs> when you look at the founders, the entrepreneurs, like, is there any difference in the character and skill, you know, from the founders of, you know, marketplace of Facebook and others? Y yeah, it, I, I think, uh, uh, there's a lot. So my, my background is, is uh, in traditional technology. Uh, I was at Dropbox and then Snapchat. My co-founder Vance was at Netflix. We, we know what it looks like and, and we know how those systems work and those organizations function. Um, so there's a lot that you can learn from them and apply to this, this new world. There's also a lot that you shouldn't apply to this new world. And so it takes a fresh perspective, but it also takes someone who has the experience of working with a team of engineers, delivering product on time, uh, thinking about new concepts and, and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And so there, there's this give and take of, you need to have the experience to be able to know that you can execute, but you also need to think differently to be able to know that this is a brand new world. Uh, you know, the, the concepts and the ways that we did things five years ago just aren't the ways that we do them today. And so you have to have both. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we're starting to see some of these people recognize, you know, especially work from home, uh, we're, we're having this conference over Zoom uh, the ability to connect with people all over the world is going to be consistent post COVID, no matter what. Uh, the ability to have teams all over the world and access those those bases of talent from any place in the in the world uh, is a really powerful concept, and and that's where decentralized organizations actually has an advantage. When COVID hit, we had calls with all of our major portfolio companies, and we said, hey. How are things going? Uh, and the vast majority of them said, everything's fine. We're, we're operating all systems go because we've been a decentralized organization for the last two years. And, and that power of having this concept of decentralization as opposed to everybody in the same office working on a centralized product for a centralized company is just a different concept. Um, and so getting people to understand that is you know, the next leg up. It's, it's, it's a process. I mean, do you use like a lean startup kind of approach with these DeFi projects? <laughs> do you talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, we, we approach uh, and uh, the further history behind us uh, is that we were entrepreneurs in the space prior to starting Framework. Um, we started a digital collectible company and, and we know what it's like. Um, and so 
what we do and, and the way that we approach venture building is, uh, it, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a lean startup process, but it, it's sort of the ways that you would approach a venture investment uh, life cycle where you have, you know, a pre-seed round where you have success criteria or benchmarks for the next leg up, the next phase of growth. You invest kind of whatever it takes to get to that next leg. And then you can consistently hit those benchmarks. Well, we're, that's how you add more capital and, and more growth and more people. Uh, and so that's how we approach ideas internally. Uh, and if an entrepreneur comes to us with an idea and, and says, hey, we want to do this and it's going to take us six months and we need $100,000 and here's what we want to have at the end of that. Here's what we're going to learn. That's great. That's exactly what we want. Uh, if, if somebody says, hey, I have this really crazy idea. It's going to take three years and a ton of capital. Uh, and it's, you know, we're going to have to get approval from all the major regulators. And but once we do that, you know, it, all systems go, that's also great. It just depends on kind of the level setting of risk and, and how we want to approach those deals. Mm -hmm. What are some of the key metrics that when you use to, for, for the DeFi projects, when you have a meter funding kind of six months, like what are, what are the key metrics of the DeFi projects? It, it really depends on the project. <laughs> um, but if, uh, for instance, you know, in the donor advised fund platform concept that, that we're spinning out currently, um, it, it really comes down to how many assets are, are in the community endowment. You know, how much value is the community managing from a charitable foundation perspective? Uh, because we think that's a powerful concept, the ability to have ownership and governance rights in a collective charitable organization is something that we haven't seen yet in DeFi and I think is just fundamentally pretty interesting. Uh, and it, it feels good when you get to participate in that and donate to charity. Um, and so that's how we evaluate that project. Um, with others, it, it really comes down to activity or engagement, um, but some of the stuff internally, uh, it really also comes down to how can we get uh, traditional stakeholders involved? How can we get the SEC to, to bless this and say that this is okay? How can we get um, traditional financial institutions to work with us because it's going to take a regulated approach to go after this market? Um, you know, those are the types of things that uh, as we're going after those deals and going after those opportunities, um, within the labs concept in particular, it, it really is sort of a, a yes or no binary equation. Did you get this? Did you find a partner that could support this? Do you have a financial institution backing this? Um, you know, because those are the things that either make it or break it for these ideas. Cool. Um, what, what, what are uh, some of the, I would say, area for, for coaching for, for founders in the DeFi space that you see you, you, you normally give them? Is there any kind of advice that you give out the most for these founders? Yeah. Um, so uh, the things that I think are different. So there's a lot of things that are the same. You know, build the best team, find the best people around you. That's how you can get the most leverage. Uh, product and developing a product for a market, finding product market fit. I, I think those are, are very kind of similar to what you'd see in traditional companies and, and venture. Uh, the things that are different though, are token economics. So thinking about this coordinate, coordination mechanism uh, of a token versus equity, um, thinking about how users will get it, thinking about the game theory behind this, thinking about the econometrics behind this, you know, that's just a new concept for so many of these ideas. And then the other thing that's new is community development. And when we're talking about open source technology, historically community is really kind of where you have your partnerships, your marketing, your customer support. It's where you have the interface to anything that's external. And so developing and fostering community is paramount. Uh, it's actually one of the, the first things that we look for if, if there's a, a launch project and we're making a venture investment, community is really kind of the first thing. You know, what's it like? How's the quality of the conversation? Do you have people that are, that are diehard supporters that are gonna go in there and answer customer support questions for people who are new to the project? And, and are they being you know, the, the best representatives of this project, even when they're not on the team? Uh, and if you can see that, you know, that's usually a good indication of, of success and, and the momentum of the project. Um, and so when you think about what it takes as a founder, you have to spend more time in, in these Discord channels. You have to spend more time interfacing with the community. Uh, you can't just be heads down on the product or, or heads down on, on recruiting. You do have to kind of readjust your time allocation. Uh, and so I think you know, that understanding and, and seeing the success of, of communities like the Chainlink or uh, Synthetics or Aave communities, you know, it's, just, it, it, it's a testament to this working. Um, and we usually use that as a good benchmark for success. And, and so we point founders that are interested in learning this stuff in those directions. Nice. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, the tokenomics and, you know, because now I think in, in the investing, um, you know, in the DeFi projects, you know, equity based, token based, like what, what's your view on that and, and how? 
how does it play out at, at, at framework? Yeah, um, so we have a token bias for anything that's decentralized. We think that tokens, in the same way that equity was the coordination mechanism, uh, historically, tokens are that same mechanism. The best part about them is that it's a complete blank slate of what you can build. Uh, you can add uh, vesting, you can add different incentives, you can use it in productive ways. It kind of becomes this marketing budget for you as well. Um, and so tokens is a really fundamentally, I would say, novel concept and innovative concept in and of itself. Um, token economics, and, and I would say it's a combination of pseudo equity, it's also a combination of marketing, and it's a combination of um, insurance. And, and so having um, the, the token be something that's fundamental to whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish uh, really is what you need to focus on from token economic perspective. Um, the things that we advise are if you are going to be using tokens to distribute to users, make sure you don't give too many tokens away at the earliest stages. You want there to be more tokens than you would have at the later stages, but if you give too much away too early, it, people don't understand what these are and, and you're not using the, the assets productively. Um, the other things uh, that we would advise are um, governance and governance rights are great, and I think that those are really important, but you can't really have true governance until you have a community with norms uh, and, a, and a really strong group of people that can step out and, and represent the community. Um, and so that really has to be something that is established first. Um, whereas if you just put out a token and say, great, you have governance rights, there's not really that much value to it. Um, and so I think, you know, pushing entrepreneurs to think about what's the, the true core use case of this token independent of governance um, and how does it relate to the network or the product that you're trying to build is really you know, kind of the core to what any token economic uh, model is. Um, and then it's just a matter of tuning it um, and, and hypercharging it when, when you need to. Um, and then the other, the last thing I'll say on token, token economics is that in 2017, we, we looked at tokenomics and, and the monetary policy as, as sacred. You, know, you, you put it out, you can't touch it. Um, and I think that in, in 2019 and 2020, we, we've somewhat disproven that. Um, if you have a, a model um, that needs to be adjusted, that needs to be changed, that should be an okay thing to do. Um, Synthetics is a prime example of this. They've pivoted and, and can, we, we help them change the monetary policy. Um, and I think that that uh, willingness to listen to the community, willingness to change is, is a really kind of important thing. You don't want to do it too much because you lose trust in the community, but you have to be willing to adjust on the fly. And that's, that's an okay thing too. Mm. So uh, what's your view on, you know, CFI, yes, uh, CFI in the future? Are you also uh, interested in, in CFI equity base or are you just all in, in tokens? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, a little bit of both. Um, so I, I think tokens are a coordination, coordination mechanism for these, uh, for these networks. Um, but like I said, 15 billion in, in total value locked in the last two years in DeFi. It's a huge number. Uh, mm. But there's an even more massive amount of assets that are sitting on balance sheets and waiting to come into this in, into the system as soon as there's on ramps and assurities and, and kind of a little bit more of a user experience um, that that's beneficial and easy to use. Um, and so for us, in, in our view, um, as we look to the next two years or three years, the things that we think will get us from 15 to 100 or 150 um, that will 10x the industry, it's, it's a lot of regulated capital. Um, and, and this comes down to things like stable coins, um, maybe having a stable coin um, back end for something that's a, a traditional product, um, like a, a payroll service or a, a, a business invoicing payment service. Uh, stable coins could be the substrate for that. And that's where you start to see the bridge between CFI and DeFi. Um, those high value opportunities require, once again, a lot of capital and a lot of time um, because we don't have regulatory clarity yet. Uh, but I think as soon as we have that, and, and hopefully we start to get more of that over the next few years, that's where we're going to start to see the bridging of the gap. Um, and, and I think that should be welcomed. Uh, I think we're talking about regulation uh, as a negative, um, but I think ultimately any regulation is a positive. It, it'll just take some time for us to adjust and change. Um, and we should be welcoming that because that's how this industry goes another 10x. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware that uh, SCB actually is a bank <laughs> and we are yeah. SCB 10x. Uh, we are like a venture arm. How, how should banks think about all this movement? Yeah, um, well, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the earliest partners to get involved at a, at a core level. Um, and I think 
you know, once again, as we saw in the internet days, um, there was a lot of questions around, are universities going to be the knowledge hubs that they previously were? Are they gonna be the bastions of academia? Um, and they still are. And, and the best universities are the ones that have adopted to the new times. They're still the best universities and, and they still have all that knowledge and academic uh, academics in, in inherent within their, their four walls. Uh, but it does take a different model uh, and it does take a different approach. And the ones that can get there fastest, I think will, will thrive. Um, and so I think banks aren't going anywhere. Banks are, are going to be you know, a core component to all of this. What we need to do as an industry is find ways of partnering with the existing financial institutions. And, and that's you know, kind of one of the goals that, that we have over the next few years is to, how, is to find the best partners, to find the ones uh, that are open to this, that are hosting you know, D, DeFi conferences um, and, uh, and, and partner with them. Um, because I think there's a lot of value to be had here. There's also a lot of experience and um, you know, benefits that existing financial institutions can bring to this space. A lot of legitimacy comes with that as well. Um, and so that should be welcomed. Okay, where should we start? Um, like investing or building or, <laughs> or both. Yeah, I, I mean, at, at Framework, we do both. Um, <laughs> and I think that's the best, uh, the best approach. There's just so much opportunity out there um, and certain things just require investment and, and participation in those investments. Certain things require bootstrapping and, and, and uh, building in-house. Um, you know, we didn't exactly touch on it, but we have a lot of internal tools and systems that aren't ever going to be spun out of Framework Labs that go directly into benefiting our, our existing venture portfolio. I think that that's also a great model for existing financial institutions that have a, a capital base, that uh, have partners and availability for investing in these networks, and then finding ways where they can be a differentiated partner to those protocols. Um, whether it be providing liquidity or providing guidance or connecting them with other financial institutions in the space, you know, that's a huge advantage. Uh, and, and I think that could be a great model um, in addition to building. Nice. Wow, time flies. So uh, last question for me. Um, any advice for entrepreneurs and developers who are starting to interest in um, Substrata DeFi project? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the best parts about Ethereum is that it's all open source. Um, and the best place to start for someone who's not into the space already is to just start playing around. Um, and at first, it'll start with, you know, borrowing some something on Compound or Aave. And, and then next, it'll be writing a Solidity contract. And then after that, it'll be deploying, you know, a, a major uh, new protocol or, or major new feature to one of these projects. And, and so it's a combination of just getting involved. Um, but then also getting involved with the communities because understanding what the conversation's like, um, providing any help, uh, you know, people are always open and welcome to that. And that's really start to, how you start to build an understanding of what a good idea and what a bad idea is. But that's also how you start to build rapport with these existing community members uh, and, and just get involved. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mike. I hope we can connect somehow offline as well because I'm doing this venture building and hope to learn a lot from you. But thank you very much for today. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Talk to you soon.